All right, everyone, in this example, I want us to determine the limits of the following sequences if they exist. So do these sequences converge and what do they converge to? Or do they diverge? And can we say anything about the divergence? Like, are they going off to positive infinity, negative infinity, or something else? This is also gonna be a good little review of limits that we learned about in Calculus 1. So let's go ahead and get started. So for the first one, we're looking at the sequence of negative one to the n over n. So let's go ahead and just for the sake of kind of learning more about the sequence, list out some of the terms in the sequence. So if we plug in n equals one, we're gonna get negative one to the power of one, which is negative one over one, which is just, just negative one really. All right, what happens if we plug in n equals two? Well, we get negative one squared, which would be positive one, and that'd be over the denominator of positive two. Okay, what is the third term of our sequence gonna be? Well, we can find out by plugging in n equals three. In the numerator, we get negative one cubed, which is gonna be negative one, and in the denominator, we get three. And so maybe we can start to see the pattern that is being established. Our numerator is always alternating between positive one and negative one, and our denominator is just increasing one at a time. So our next few terms would be positive one fourth, then negative one fifth, then positive one sixth, and so on. And so this sequence is not a geometric sequence or an arithmetic sequence. The difference between the terms is not a constant and the ratio between uh, adjacent terms is also not a constant ratio. So what is the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms in our sequence? Well, we can try to find it by taking the limit of this explicit formula for the terms in our sequence. And technically, to find the limit as n goes to infinity of negative one to the n over n, we'd have to use the squeeze theorem back from calculus. And by applying that squeeze theorem, we essentially say, well, the numerator is always smallest at negative one, and similarly, the numerator is also always biggest at positive one. So our terms, negative one to the n over n, are always squeezed between at minimum negative one over n and at maximum positive one over n. And so if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of all three sides of this inequality, we see the left-hand side goes to zero. The right-hand side also goes to zero. So therefore, the middle piece of our inequality, the sequence or the terms we're actually interested in must also go to zero. All right, so by using the squeeze theorem from calculus one, we see that this first sequence, negative one to the power of n over n, does converge and it converges to zero. All right, so up next, let's go ahead and take a look at this sequence where the terms are defined explicitly by three n squared minus n over four n squared. So we might not need to list out the terms to, to figure out if the uh, limit of the sequence exists or not, or if it converges. But let's go ahead and do it just as some additional practice. So we're gonna assume here, because it's not given, uh, that our terms start at n equals one. Definitely can't start at n equals zero because we'd get that division by zero issue. So if we plug in n equals one, what do we get in the numerator? Well, we're gonna get three minus one or two. And in the denominator, we'll get four times one or just four. That is our n equals one term or the first term in our sequence, two fourths or simplified to one half. Well, what do we get if we plug n equals two into our sequence? We'll have to be a little bit more careful with our arithmetic, but we should get three times four squared, which is 12. 12 minus two is 10. And that 10 will be over four times another two squared or four times four, which is 16. So let's see, we've gone from um, two fourths or eight sixteenths to 10 sixteenths. So at the moment, just looking at these first two terms in our sequence, it looks like the terms are growing and increasing. Are they increasing without bound or are they going to eventually approach a single finite number? A little more analysis is needed. Let's go ahead and list out at least one or two more terms to see if we can figure it out. So if we plug n equals three into our formula, we're gonna get three times three squared or three times nine, that's 27. You have to do 27 minus three, which will give us a numerator of 24. And in the denominator, we're gonna get four times three squared or four times nine, which is 36. All right, let's just go ahead and list out one more term in the sequence for some practice. 
So if we plug in n equals 4, we're going to get 3 times 4 squared, or 3 times 16. That gives us 48. We have to also subtract our n value of 4 from 48, and that will give us 44. Hopefully I'm not messing up my arithmetic here. And then in the denominator, we're going to get 4 times 4 squared, or 4 cubed. That will be 4 times 4 times 4, which should give us 64. So it's a bit hard to tell from listing out the terms in our sequence whether this sequence will converge or not, but good thing we have calculus, because we can also just take the limit as n goes to infinity of the explicit formula for the terms in our sequence, that is the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n squared minus n all over 4n squared. And so if we try to do some kind of direct substitution, what we see is that our numerator and our denominator are both going to increase without bound or approach infinity. So what we have to do to find this limit is use something like L'Hopital's rule or some of those previous limit rules, like if the uh, degree of the numerator and the denominator are the same as you take the limit as n goes to infinity, then um, you just take the ratio of those leading coefficients. But that's one way to do it. I'm going to go ahead and finish this limit off by using L'Hopital's rule just as a little refresher of how L'Hopital's rule works. And what L'Hopital's rule says is if you're taking the limit of a ratio that approaches one of these indeterminate quotients like infinity over infinity or zero over zero, you can find the limit instead by looking at the limit of the, uh, the ratio of the derivative of the numerator to the derivative of the denominator. So we can take the derivative of this numerator here, 3n squared minus n. That derivative will give us 6n minus 1. And we divide that by the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of 4n squared is going to be 8n. So we're going to use L'Hopital's rule until this limit resolves, even though we might be able to figure it out sooner than that. But looking at what we now have, from L'Hopital's rule, we know our original limit is equivalent to the limit as n goes to infinity of 6n minus 1 over 8n. But that will, again, approach infinity over infinity. So what do we do here? We apply L'Hopital's rule yet again. And so now if we apply L'Hopital's rule again, we take the derivative of our numerator to get 6 and the derivative of our denominator to get 8. And now we're just looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of a constant. And that limit is going to be the constant itself of 6 over 8 or 3 fourths if we simplify. So what do we know about this sequence? The sequence that is defined by the explicit formula where the terms are given by 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. We know that this limit or the sequence is going to converge and the terms in the sequence are going to get closer and closer to three-fourths. All right, two down, two to go. Let's go ahead and look at our third sequence here. And here in this sequence, the terms in our sequence are defined as cosine of n. So like before, let's go ahead and list out a few of our terms to see if we can get a sense of what is going on here. Okay, well, the first term in our sequence is going to be cosine of 1, then cosine of 2, followed by cosine of 3, then cosine of 4, and so on. All right, so I used the calculator to help assist me in evaluating cosine of 1, 2, 3, and 4, and my calculator is in radian mode when I'm doing so. And for the first term, we get a decimal of approximately 0.54. For the second term, we get a decimal of negative 0.416, followed by negative 0.990 approximately, and then negative 0.654, and so on. And so there's no kind of discernible pattern that we can see from listing out the terms in the sequence. And this shouldn't be too surprising, because if we think about the graph of our cosine function, remember it is one of those periodic functions that just keeps rotating through the values between negative 1 and positive 1. And because our inputs are just these consecutive integers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, we're never hitting any of those nice points or getting close to those nice points on our cosine function, which all involve those factors of pi. So this is our first example of a sequence that diverges. It does not exist. It does not diverge towards negative infinity or towards positive infinity because it's just going to always kind of oscillate between these values, between negative 1 and positive 1. So the limit of this sequence, cosine of n, does not exist. So we're looking at our last example here, sequence number 4. 
where the terms in our sequence are the most complicated of all of them so far. The terms are given explicitly by the formula cosine of 1 over n minus the quantity 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. And so we're not going to take the time to list some of the terms of the sequence out. Instead, I want to use this example to remind us that a lot of those, almost all of those limit laws we learned from calculus 1 and 2 apply for sequences as well. So if we want to see if uh, this sequence uh, converges or not and what the limit of the sequence is, we just have to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this explicit formula describing the terms in our sequence. So that'll be the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of 1 over n minus 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. So if we're taking the limit of a sum or difference of quantities, we can apply the limit to each term in that sum and difference and take the limit of the, uh, the sum or difference instead, or the sum and difference of the limits is what I should have said. So what that means is we can take the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of 1 over n and subtract away from that the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. And well, we already did some earlier analysis to figure out what the second limit is going to be. Another limit law we can use is if our explicit formula involves a continuous function, like cosine, then we can pass the limit into the continuous function. So we can rewrite this as cosine of the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n, and we're still subtracting away from all of this the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. Okay, so now what do we have? Well, we can take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n before evaluating or using the cosine piece of our formula. And if we remember from calculus 1, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n will approach 0. So we're dividing 1 by these bigger and bigger numbers. The overall ratio or quotient has to be getting smaller and smaller. So that will converge to cosine of 0. And we can subtract away from that the limit as n goes to infinity of this rational function, 3n squared minus n over 4n squared. But as we learned from our previous example, that limit approached 3 fourths. So we also need to remember from trig, cosine of 0 is 1. So this approaches 1 minus 3 fourths, or just 1 fourth. So this last sequence does in fact uh, converge, and the limit of our sequence is going to be exactly one-fourth.